Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. It's Saturday, and that means one thing, the weekly Crime Talk recap. I hope you enjoy. Thanks for watching. Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. This is Crime Talk. My name is Scott Reich. Thanks for watching. If you haven't done so already, will you please hit that subscribe button as well as the little bell so that you receive notifications of when we go live or put up new content. First on the docket, Lori Vallow. She has a motions hearing today with her husband, Chad Daybell. That's right. Well, first of all, Lori Vallow wants to be called Lori Noreen Daybell. In fact, the attorney for Ms. Vallow, which we're going to continue to con call her Ms. Vallow, because frankly, it sounds much more interesting and it helps keep all the players apart. Uh, she was a Vallow when these crimes were committed, and we're going to follow through with that regardless of what her desires are. Needless to say, her attorneys filed a motion saying, hey, these two were married back in Hawaii, Chad and Lori, and refer to them as Daybell. Okay, for whatever that's worth. I guess they want to make sure they have the correct spelling when the possible conviction comes down and forever follows her for the rest of her days. Now, a couple of motions were filed last week. There was a motion for change of venue. In fact, some of that's going to be discussed today at the hearing. Hopefully you'll hit the link and follow that video as well. Hopefully we'll give you some analysis of that today. Basically, what it comes down to is the defense says that they have an expert witness regarding a change of venue. And when you do a change of venue, oftentimes you do a survey to say, hey, listen, we interviewed this number of people and they all said they formed an opinion, therefore client cannot get a fair trial. Apparently the defense forgot to turn this information over, didn't want to endorse who actually did the report. And the district attorney said, hey, I'm not sure why this hasn't been turned over. So judge, make sure no one is allowed to testify. Of course, Mark Means comes to the last minute saying, hey, here's the information. Uh, and don't confuse my lay witness with an expert witness. Well, lay witnesses and expert witnesses are held to a much different standard. A lay witness is when somebody asks, you know, is being asked on the witness stand, could you tell if the individual was drunk? Well, yes, I've seen people that are intoxicated. He appeared to be drunk, right? Were they an influence of drugs? What was the speed going? Expert witness is going to be somebody that provides an analysis based upon some specialized training or knowledge that they have. Clearly a statistician or somebody doing some sort of evaluation of surveys would be somebody that would be qualified as an expert. So I'm sure it's going to be a complete goat rope this afternoon when we have that hearing, we'll bring it to you live because who doesn't like to see a good car crash take place? but we'll be fair and impartial as we try to cover that. Next on the docket, Barry Morphew is moving on. That's right, you remember Barry Morphew, the husband of the missing Colorado mom, Suzanne Morphew. He has sold the home that they shared together for $1.62 million, almost 10 months after his wife's mysterious disappearance. Barry Morphew finalized the sale of the three bedroom residence, which is in Salida, on Thursday, the buyer is listed as Mountain Renewal, a limited liability company from Nevada. Barry and Suzanne Morphew's names both appear as the sellers on the deed, meaning money from the sale is likely to be transferred into a joint account. Now, Barry Morphew, who's 52, raised eyebrows last October when he first put his home on the market for $1.75 million, just five months after Suzanne Morphew, who was 50 years old when missing. Suzanne reportedly set off from the home on a bike ride on Mother's Day, May 10th, and has not been seen since. The FBI searched the home twice in the weeks following her disappearance, seizing several items for forensic examination. The couple had lived at the home with their two daughters, Mallory and Macy, since April of 2018. Barry previously told news reporters that he decided to sell the home because Mallory and Macy are too scared to stay there because they believe it was the site of Suzanne Morphew's abduction, which is a little odd because I thought she went on a bike ride and her bike was found down the road. Hmm. But the family home is not the only property. Barry has also recently sold another piece of property 
that he recently purchased in Salida for $150,000. It may appear as though the family has decided to give up on the fact that Suzanne Morphew may come home safely. Her father, who passed away recently, actually listed Suzanne Morphew as presumed dead in her father's obituary. Barry Morphew claims that he was in the Denver area working on a landscaping job at the time that his wife disappeared. And co-workers have stated that the hotel room that Barry had booked in the Denver area for the night of May 10th stank of bleach and was littered with wet towels. Not to be made to look like a suspect, Barry Morphew has offered a $100,000 reward for Suzanne's safe return. He previously theorized that his wife may have been taken by a wild animal. He now says he believes that she was abducted. Not exactly sure what has changed his mind. Suzanne's brother, Andy Mormon, has blasted Barry for his behavior following Suzanne's mysterious vanishing, implicating him in her disappearance. Andy Mormon has stated, I don't think she ever got on her bike. I think she probably died on May 9th, and she was hidden somewhere that night. I'm afraid that this is domestic abuse, according to Mr. Mormon. Now, obviously, we'll give Barry Morphew the presumption of innocence, as he's never been charged with a crime in any way, nor has the Salida uh, police or the sheriff um, given any indication that he is a person of interest. No word as to where Barry Morphew will be residing after the sale. It's unclear whether he'll stay in Colorado or move on to a different state. We'll keep you posted. Please go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up for a background subscription service. You'll be happy you did. If there's anyone out there you were ever curious about what was in their background, now is the time to do it. If you're going to get involved with somebody, now is the time to do it. When you go to crimetalksearch.com, you put in the name, literally millions of public records are searched and a report is generated. And it's going to give you a report. If they have multiple social media accounts, you're going to find it. If they have multiple phone numbers, multiple email addresses, it's going to be found. And more importantly, you're going to get information regarding criminal history. Hopefully the person you're searching has none whatsoever, but if it's there, it's going to be found. You're going to get everything you'd want to know, whether you're going into business or whether you're going into a personal relationship, you're going to be able to find out the information you want to know. So go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up today. You'll be happy you did. The South Dakota Attorney General Jason Ravsborg is scheduled to have an initial hearing on his case in Pierre, South Dakota this Friday. Video won't be permitted, but the audio will. We'll bring it to you if there's something of interest. For those of you who do not recall, the Attorney General was charged last month with one count of operating a motor vehicle while using a mobile electronic device, i.e. a cell phone. Second, lane driving in violation of the South Dakota codified law. And then finally, count three, careless driving. Count one comes from Ravsborg's behavior while driving east prior to the accident. Counts two and three are directly connected to Mr. Bover's death that was the result of hitting the attorney general's front right fender as well as his windshield. Now, the attorney general has some other issues pending. That's right. The articles of impeachment that have been filed against uh, the attorney general have basically been put on hold to see what comes out in the criminal court case. Now, as we've all learned over the last couple of years, impeachment is a political process much different from that of the criminal case, and one can be impeached for anything they basically the House and Senate in the states uh, desire. No one has ever been impeached uh, in South Dakota. We'll see if the attorney general is the first. We'll also have to wait and see as to whether he enters a plea or enters a plea of not guilty. Several of those charges come from his own statements that he made while he was being interviewed, not once, but twice by the police. You can actually watch those interviews. Let me know what you think did the attorney general do himself any favors or did he hurt himself by giving that interview? The Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell matter 
can the legal proceedings get any more bizarre? Some information was sent to me today that shows that Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell have each filed a motion for an ex parte protective order. Let's talk about this. A protective order is normally a court order from the court saying you cannot disclose information usually to the defense, usually to the defendant. He can review it, he can look at it, but he can't get a copy of it. He can't disseminate it. A protective, a protective order in a criminal case is there usually to protect information, usually a person. It's, it's normally issued if there's a concern that some information could get out and someone could be harmed by it. Not once in 25 years of criminal law practice have I ever or have I ever seen somebody file an ex parte motion for a protective order? Ex parte means that we can't have the other side participate in it and that basically it is such an emergency that this needs to take place. Now, this case is so unusual, maybe there's something out there. I've been trying to think about it. What could it possibly be that the defense doesn't want turned over basically to the public, I guess, and also the prosecutor can't be present? The prosecutor is going to be able to find out what it is. The information would simply just not be released or disseminated to parties that did not have a need for it or were not specifically involved in the case. So I haven't seen the motion. Obviously, it's going to be sealed. It's going to be ex parte. But the judge to grant it would have to say that a grave or imminent harm would be taking place if I don't sign this ex parte protective order. I've never seen anything done like this before. Maybe it's something unique to Idaho. I just can't imagine it. Criminal law in the essence is criminal law everywhere. Yes, things change a little bit here and there. Each state may have a particular customary way of doing something, but at the end of the day, it's a criminal trial. The rules really come from the United States Constitution. So an ex parte protective order, we'll just have to wait and see. I just don't get it. The city of Minneapolis has settled with the George Floyd family. Guess what the dollar amount was? That's right, $27 million. Let me say that again. $27 million to settle a civil lawsuit from George Floyd's family over his death while in police custody, even as a jury is being seated as we speak for the officers on trial for his death. Now, the Minneapolis City Council emerged from closed session to announce the record settlement, which includes $500,000 for the neighborhood where Mr. Floyd was arrested. Now, we know that he was trying to use a fake $20 bill to get some stuff, but I don't think the restitution equals $500,000. But if that's the way the city wants to spend their money, so be it. We know that they tried to defund the police. That didn't turn out so well. And then they put the some $60 million back into the budget because, oh, what happens when the police go away? Crime goes through the roof. All right. Needless to say, the Floyd family attorney, Mr. Crump, who is just everywhere these days, said that he was obviously pleased with the settlement. He says that this is the largest pre-trial civil rights settlement ever and it sends a powerful message that black lives do matter and that police brutality against people of color must end. Let me know what you think about this settlement, $27 million. Now, the city must really be trying to say Derek Chauvin is guilty because we just paid $27 million. So please convict Derek Chauvin, the jury, so that you do not burn our city down. Is that what the city's trying to do here? I think that this settlement should be turned over immediately to the defense in this particular case. Why? Well, if the city is making admissions that they failed to properly train their police officers and that the training that they did give to the police officers was not good training, well, 
that is basically exculpatory evidence that the defense should, in fact, be entitled to. If I was the defense on this case, I think that I would be demanding a complete copy of that settlement agreement immediately. Now, the fact that this came out during jury selection for the trial of Derek Chauvin, and I think as of the time of this filming, I think they've got seven jurors selected, that you may have to go back and re-question those potential jurors so that um, the fact that there's some $27 million being paid out of the city's coffers, uh, that if that would influence the decision in any way possible. Now, the other issue is going to be, I think Mr. Floyd had a son um, and obviously he had brothers and sisters. A lot of people stepped up saying that George Floyd was the greatest guy ever. Right after his death, I know nothing about the man. I wish him nothing ill. Uh, but as I've said before, it's always about the money. I'd be curious to see how that distribution of the money after Mr. Kump's portion of his fee uh, gets cut out. I would imagine he's taking anywhere between 35 to 50% of that $27 million as his attorney's fees. And what's left over will go to the family. I'd be curious to see to whom all that money goes to in the Floyd family. And it's nice to see that Mr. Floyd's family was there for him to collect the checks. I wish they had possibly been there before he was out on the streets allegedly committing crime and being engaged in the drug underworld culture whereby he was using methamphetamines and fentanyl. And the only reason I bring that up is because the defense in Mr. Floyd's case is going to hype on that to the ends of the trial. Bottom line, no disrespect in any way, but these are facts that are going to come out for sure. Um, I think I'd also, if I was the defense, I'd be asking for any emails from the attorney general's office who's prosecuting that case between other city officials to see if there was anything requesting about getting that settlement done before this trial starts. Please go follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and even TikTok. That's right. All right, have a great weekend. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk. Oh,